All right, excellent. Welcome everyone to another EBFA webinar. This one is going to be sponsored by Navoso because we are going to use the Kinesis board in a little bit of our practical part of the webinar. I also have some exciting news about the Kinesis board, so definitely hang on. All right, so watch that walk. I get asked all the time about gait assessment, the power of gait, how to assess it, what is an optimal gait pattern. This is actually a session that I did at the IDEA World, IDEA PTI, and a couple other conferences this year, and just really wanted it wanted to bring this to all of you as well, just in case if you have not been at any of those conferences. Okay, my background real quick, if this happens to be your first webinar or it's been a while since you've been on anything with me, my name is Dr. Emily, Dr. Splickle. I am a functional podiatrist, so I do see patients. Uh, most of my patients are virtual. Someone did ask a question, Becky, that was yours. I do do virtual consultations. That would be really my website, which is dremilysplickle.com. You can go on there and book the appointments. I do see patients in Arizona. I'm actually in my podiatry office right Right now, in addition to functional podiatry, I'm a human movement specialist, founder of EBFA Global. So do go to ebfaglobal.com, get some continuing education, some courses, certifications. Uh, I'm the author of Barefoot Strong, which is a fun, quick read that you can get on Amazon. It's also available on Naboso in the U.S. And then co-founder, CEO of Naboso. These are some of the social handles follow if you would like. Here we go. Guess what, you guys? There is going to be a ridiculous offer, ridiculous offer on the Kinesis board that is happening at the end of this webinar. So stay tuned. Hang on, everyone. But if you have to go, I completely understand. Everyone will get the recording tonight. So give me roughly four hours from when this ends and I will upload that and send it to everyone so that you can listen to that recording. There will be a special code at the end with our awesome offer around the Kinesis board. All right, so our goal with this session or with this lecture is going to be appreciating the importance of walking as the foundation to movement efficiency. And this concept of efficiency is very important. So when I treat a patient, I am not just thinking about, can I get them to walk? Can they walk across the room without pain? Pain is not my goal. My goal is really much more about the optimization of movement. Are they moving using the least amount of energy? Are they using the energy that is given to them from the ground and having this symbiotic relationship? Are they moving fascially? Fascial movement is going to be efficient movement, right? So we're going to review that concept a little bit more. We're going to go into the gait cycle, the different phases of gait, the demands for each phase, and really dive into these three foundational requirements for efficient gait. And then we'll go into a little bit on programming for you guys, okay? All right. So as we kick this off, to set the tone around uh, gait efficiency. That's really what I'm focusing on here, right? Now, for me, I'm going to go into the phases. So if some of you are like, no, no, I wanted to understand how to like really assess and break down gait, I will be going into that where you can start to observe compensation patterns. However, you will not be a gait expert in a 60-minute webinar, right? But what I do is I encourage you to go through the BTS level one and then the BTS level two certification. The BTS level two really focuses on nothing but gait, assessing gait, how to create programming based off of your assessment. All of those are available online. That is in our Teachable School. That will be sent to an email to everyone, but it's ebfa.teachable.com. And then you can find the Barefoot Training Specialist level one, level two. Okay. So, here we go. We're talking about efficiency. Walking is designed to be efficient, which means that if you are thinking about your gait, your patient's gait, your client's gait, right? The reason why we want to do a gait assessment is it really helps you, the specialist, understand your client's mobility 
intrinsic strength, sensory perception, body schema. So what is their awareness to their body in relation to the external environment? How do they use their postural and their fascial integration to stabilize and transfer that energy, right? So there's a lot of information that we can garner from a dynamic assessment such as gait. Squat assessments are great, right? Um, but there's no dynamic transfer of impact forces unless you're doing like kind of a box jump, step down, step up kind of movement. But the momentous characteristic of walking is very important to how we want to understand this assessment. Okay. Now, efficiency, gait efficiency is built off of your understanding of gravity. Gravity is a very important sensory stimulation that we experience every day. Gravity is our body's potential energy. So every single time you walk and your foot strikes the ground, you are experiencing impact forces. Those impact forces are your body's potential energy. You are going to absorb them, store them somewhere in your body, and then release them when you take your next step. This is what efficient movement is based around. Now, oftentimes when I do my certifications, I dive in really heavy and I talk about every time we walk, we experience one to one and a half times your body weight in impact forces. Let's just call it one for the sake of this, right? One time your body weight in impact forces. Your body is going to absorb it, store it. And by the time you release it, you are actually releasing two and a half times your body weight, two and a half times your body weight. So let's step back for a second. If you are walking, your foot strikes the ground, you are given this gift of a one times your body weight in impact, right? Here, Dr. Emily, here's 120 pounds of impact force, right? I'm going to absorb it. By the time I release it, I'm actually releasing 300 pounds of elastic energy, right? So there's this compounding effect that is happening in our system when we move dynamically. And that's actually what I look for in my patients. I want them to be able to double the amount of energy that is coming in. So I ask you, if you think about this, how is that possible? How do I get one time my body weight and release two and a half times my body weight? Where is that characteristic happening, right? Well, we know that potential energy is converted into elastic energy. So where's this elastic energy return occurring? I hope at home you guys are saying your fascia, your connective tissue, your tendons, right? That is where we get our elastic recoil during dynamic movement. That is what we are trying to do. So this conversion from potential to elastic energy is really a fascial response. We are designed to move fascially. I want my patients, I want all of you guys and your patients and your clients to be moving fascially. That means that there's a level of effortlessness, there's minimal joint stress, there is a lightness to the body, right? And then of course they're efficient, right? So we were designed to move fascially. Now, if I was not able to compound the energy that is coming in, which means I'm not moving muscularly, right? Then that means I'm using my other system, which is going to be the muscular system. Another way that you could think of this is as we're walking, right? So leg is behind, is swinging forward, swinging forward. It's kind of, it's referred to as the pendulum theory of gait, but I want you to think of it almost like a, a boomerang or a bow and arrow. So I'm taking the bow and arrow and I'm pulling back. I'm essentially potentiating the bow and arrow when I pull it back, right? So I got to pull back, I'm fully tense, and then I'm going to recoil, and then obviously the arrow goes forward, okay? I think that same thing, that when we're walking and our heel is behind us, and we are in the late mid stance, that is us potentiating the bow and arrow. So by the time I come forward to the ball of my foot, and I swing my leg through, oh my gosh, you guys are probably like, I'm going to Emily, show me your legs, right? So I'm here, and I'm recoiling through here, right? 
potentiating. Now I come into my lever and I'm starting to recoil that energy forward. Okay. If I do not have this compounding effect of elastic energy, the bow and arrow is not potentiated. The only way that I can get my leg forward during the gait cycle is I need to pull it forward which means I need to use my body's own energy. I need to expend work to bring this leg forward in front of the center of mass, okay? So just off the baseline, if you're starting to assess your clients, the clients that move fascially are moving efficiently. The clients that are moving muscularly are not moving efficiently. That is where we start to break down the system, okay? So all of this starts with the potential energy, right? That's where this whole story starts, right? Is one, can you feel the impact forces? Can you absorb them? And then are you able to store and recoil them? So the perception of impact forces, the way that we perceive impact forces, if anyone took my certification or other courses, you should know for sure that impact forces are perceived as a vibration. Impact forces are perceived as vibration, okay? Can we perceive them? They are perceived by the nerves in the bottom of the feet. Your FA1, FA2, your corpuscles. These are sensitive to vibration. Once you feel it, you got to be able to absorb it. The way that we absorb it is through isometric contractions that create myofascial tension in our system. And then that transfer of the potentiated fascia and that tension is essentially from that elastic recoil. So we'll dive into these a little bit more, but I just want you to understand like the complexity of human movement and how a lot of this begins with our relationship with our feet, the ground, and then how that connects to the body, right? So one, can you feel your feet do you have tons of pushing in your shoes that you actually aren't feeling the vibration? Do you have neuropathy so you're not feeling the vibration, right? I don't know. Do you have weak feet so you can't contract isometrically fast enough and then that's where you're not absorbing it? You're actually getting plantar fasciitis and stress fractures? I don't know. And then do you have enough elastic recoil and hydration to your myofascial system so you can recoil it? Any of those starts to break down, your client will not be moving efficiently. Okay, so here we go. These are your three requirements for efficient gait patterns. Three requirements for efficient gait pattern. First, you gotta be able to balance on one leg. That was a key evolutionary advance in the human foot and body to allow us to become bipedal is that homo sapiens were able to stand up and balance on one leg. So being able to stand on one leg is a necessary requirement for efficient gait. It is how you take long steps. Two, you must be able to absorb and transfer energy, which means you have to have a myofascial isometric intrinsic capacity within your foot and your foot to core system in order to damp the vibrations as they enter your system. And then third, the whole point of walking is that you get somewhere, right? So you have to be able to create forward progression. The way that we move forward is through becoming a rigid lever in our foot and be, be, being able, again, to take long steps. Okay, so these are going to be our requirements. Now, before we take a deeper dive in those requirements, I'm going to share with you guys the gait cycle. All right, so here we go. This starts your gait 101. All right, so during the walking gait cycle, you have two phases of gait. We have two legs, therefore you have two phases of gait. We spend a majority of our time in stance phase. You can see that we spend 60% of our time in stance phase, 40% in swing phase. We see a majority of our injuries occurring during stance phase. So we get injured typically when we are on the ground. So I often will say, if you are trying to minimize injuries in an athlete running, walking, other sports, is you are essentially trying to shorten their contact time. 
The shorter the contact time, the shorter the exposure to the impact forces. So as much as we need impact forces, we don't want to be delayed. We don't want to just be sitting in that vibration, right? So you want to be able to contact, absorb, boom, get off of the ground, okay? In fact, the faster that you can create myofascial tension, the faster you can get off of the ground. So it's definitely one trick for your athletes. Stance phase, that's really where we're going to put our focus, again, for the sake of this, because we do not have several days, right? So we're going to break down stance phase into actually five phases. So stance phase is going to be broken down into initial contact, loading response, mid stance, late mid stance, and propulsion, okay? So you got the contact, you're going to experience those vibrations, that potential energy, you are very rapidly going to absorb it. Then you're going to get into that peak stabilization position. Then you're going to shift forward where you are potentiating the bow and arrow. And then you're going to start to recoil that energy forward. That's how I want you to think of this. Of course, we're gonna dive into these a little bit deeper, but that's kind of high level how you want to break down that gait cycle, looking specifically at the stance phase, okay? Now, initial contact, heel strike. We do contact the heel first when we walk, yes. If you think that there's some debate of midfoot contacting your foot or forefoot contacting when you walk, heel contact is how you strike the ground in a bipedal walk pattern. Okay, so we are walking, striking the outside of our heel. This is experience, or this is where you're experiencing that one time your body weight impact peak. You can actually see here, this is a force peak curve. This is looking at uh, body weight, essentially force relative to body weight over time. This is going to be your one to 1.5 times your body weight. There's a drop. And then you can actually see here's where it actually goes higher. So the highest point of your peak energy, right, is coming up. And that's where you're pushing off and taking a step, okay? So you contact the heel. Now, part of your assessment, everyone, is that the part of the heel that you want to contact when we walk is going to be the outside aspect. Let me get through here. Blah, blah, blah. We got through this. Hold on. Sorry, you guys. Oh my gosh. Here we go. So when you walk, you actually want to strike the outside of your heel. The outside of your heel gets contacted first. So if you look at your client's shoes, I don't have any shoes with me. I'm sorry. They're in my other office over there. But if you look at some of the shoes, grab a sneaker, grab a sandal, something, and look at the back of the heel. Normal wear patterns are on the outside or the lateral part of the heel. That is normal. I do not know how, I can't tell you how many patients come in and say, oh my God, Dr. Splickle, the, I'm wearing out my shoes wrong. Look at the outside. They're totally worn out. And I tell them, you know what? It's actually fine, right? We want to wear out the outside of our heel first. Now, why we want to contact the ground on the lateral part of our heel is that you are striking the ground in a inverted slash supinated position. This is technically more stable for your body. Okay. Second reason is going to have to do with how you load energy, but you strike the ground lateral part of the heel in an inverted slash supinated position. Okay. That's where you experience the one and a half times your body weight in energy. Okay. Now here it's saying this is entering the body in a rate of less than 50 milliseconds, less than 50 milliseconds. Now, why I put the time in there is that it takes 70 milliseconds for your muscles to contract 70 milliseconds, right? So if energy is coming into my system faster than my muscles can contract, I cannot react to impact. I must be anticipating impact. Now, something that is huge around the barefoot training, the minimal space, everything that I advocate is about being pre-active, anticipatory. We need to be in control of our movements, which means every reaction in my neuromuscular system really should be based around anticipation, not reaction. Reaction time is very difficult for the body to be fast enough. 
Obviously, there's reactive neuromuscular training and you're reacting to shifts in your center of gravity, but this is part of your training. And so can you expose the system to these perturbations or to these experiences so it is prepared when it is in really the real world? Okay, we already went through this. How do we perceive impact forces? That's going to be vibration, right? We perceive the vibration through the mechanoceptors in the bottom of the feet, specifically FA1, FA2, these mechanoceptors in the bottom of the feet. And then it has to go with how do we absorb it? We know it's vibration. We know how we perceive it. You put cushion in the shoes, it's going to take away the vibration. It's going to make it hard for your system to feel it, right? So therefore... The next step is going to be, how do you absorb it, right? So the way that we absorb vibrations is going to be based around isometric contractions. And this is referred to as the muscle tuning theory. So when you take a tuning fork, a tuning fork, so this is how I often explain it so that people, clients, patients can understand this, is if I have a tuning fork and I strike it, so now it's vibrating, and as the tuning fork is vibrating, essentially, how would I stop the tuning fork from vibrating? What do I do? I'm going to touch it. As soon as I touched it and pushed against the tuning fork, it stopped vibrating. So think of that in your system. If I'm walking or running and my foot strikes the ground and it's vibrating, this is my tibia and my metatarsals vibrating. I don't want them to be vibrating. That's how I get stress fractures, right? So how am I going to damp it? I'm going to boop, contract the intrinsic muscles of my feet. Boom, isometric. Isometric contractions acts like splints next to the bones. It creates a stiffening response to damp and absorb vibrations, okay? Now that is referred to as the muscle tuning theory. Take it even further. This is really based also around compartment pressure. All of this, the muscle tuning theory is a theory by Dr. Ben O'Neig, N-I-G-G, out of the University of Calgary. He's done a lot of this research. And essentially what it's saying is that when your muscles contract isometrically and your muscles are housed in compartments, so these lower leg compartments, when those muscles contract isometrically, the pressure in the compartment increases and that's really what's creating the stiffening response or this splinting mechanism. So it's kind of the, it's the isometric, but really it's the pressure that's created by the isometric, right? You could almost think of this like why we engage our transverse abdominals. So if we're about to do like a back squat or I'm just picking up something heavy, right? Why do we engage the transverse abdominals? Because you're trying to increase intra-abdominal pressure. That intra-abdominal pressure is essentially protecting and essentially splinting your lower back so that you can lift that weight without straining the lower back and the discs of your lumbar spine. Same thing here, right? So compartment pressure during the gait cycle is very important. You can see here we have four compartments in our lower leg. Test question, you have nine compartments in your foot, nine compartments, right? So I often will say that our foot is designed to be stiff. The foot is designed to be stiff. Now, not rigid, I didn't say rigid, right? Transiently stiff, myofascially stiff, isometrically stiff, but not rigid, it's not stuck, right? It's a moment in time right? So we want to understand the functional purpose of compartment pressure, okay? Which is what I just told you. It acts like a splinting mechanism, right? So this loading response is really where you are bringing in the impact forces and storing it in your connective tissue as potential energy. Very, very important. You're storing it. We're storing it. Yeah. Okay. Now, Let's talk about mechanics real quick, because some of you are going to be wanting to do some gait assessments here. When you watch someone walk, first phase, initial contact, lateral side of the heel, watch them walk. Do they strike the outside of their heel? And they're going to very quickly roll into a eversion internal rotation moment of their lower extremity, meaning knee down, their tibia and their foot, right? Eversion internal rotation is how you absorb energy. Okay, it's time to go to mid stance, right? So we just lateral, 
everted, internally rotated, but now we're already in our mid stance. As soon as your client is in mid stance, I need to see that heel in neutral. I need you neutral. I need you stable because you are standing on one leg. And what happens? What happens when you transition from two legs to one leg? What muscle is going to kick in? I hope you're saying the glutes, right? Your glute medius. What happened when you look at the evolution of the human pelvis relative to the primate pelvis, right? A primate's pelvis is flat. It is like this and their glutes are directly behind making them very powerful sagittal hip extenders. The human pelvis rotates out, which as it rotates, you're wrapping your glutes into the frontal plane, right? So now we're getting some abduction, adduction control of the pelvis. Bam. As soon as you transfer into that mid stance with a neutral foot, you're going to go all the way into your glutes, activate them to stabilize your pelvis. Okay. So do you see a little bit of a hip drop? Yes, that is normal. That is something that you do observe when someone is walking. You want to see that. I'm going to give you a little sprinkle of an assessment that you can do. Cause again, some of you I know are going to want your assessments. So if we are standing up, your hands are on your hips. My hands are on my ASIS. My feet are going to be together. Now this is called a cha-cha assessment. I did not make up that name because again, it's going to be like the cha-cha. And see my knees that I am bending them, okay? So hands are on the hips, beautiful. And I want you to bend your right knee, boom. Sorry, you guys, not best outfit to wear for this. Bend your right knee and then make your leg straight again. Bend your right knee, make your leg straight again. Keep your hands on your ASIS. Bend your knee, straighten it. Beautiful. Now, every time you do that, do you feel your pelvis drop and then come back up? Drop, come back up. Do the other side. Bend your left knee, stand up. Bend your left knee, stand up. Did you feel it drop as well? right? So this dropping of the pelvis when you bend your knee is mimicking what happens when you go from here, you pick up your leg and you enter swing. Essentially, the pelvis is dropping to the side where you bent your knee, right? And then you're going to swing your leg forward, okay? So a assessment that you would do is essentially keep your hands on your ASIS, bend your right knee straight, bend your left knee straight, Right, left, right, left, right, left. And as you do that on yourself and on your clients, do you feel this drop of your pelvis? And is it symmetrical? Is one side a little sticky, right? That drop is essentially triggering the lateral hip, goes all the way back down to your lateral line, stabilizes the foot, right? important connection. So foot to pelvis stability is based around fascial tensioning. This is going to activate the lateral line, the spiral line, tensegrity, stable. Love it, love it, love it. Okay. Here's our lateral line, just in case if you are not familiar with it. All right, good. So as the client is walking, right, you're looking at that foot, you're looking at the pelvis. Okay. If they are everted, in that mid stance position, everted and unlocked, I almost guarantee that they're not going to be loading and unloading energy efficiently, right? Most likely there's going to be some sort of transfer stress all the way up into the pelvis. Okay. All right. Time to go forward. Here we go. Late mid stance. So this is going to be, I'm pulling the bow and arrow back, right? Your heel is behind you. Your heel is on the floor and you are stretching your Achilles tendon. This is the period of peak potential energy, okay? Peak potential energy. Now, in order to get peak potential energy, you have to have optimal ankle dorsiflexion, okay? So the amount of ankle dorsiflexion that you need to walk is going to be five, five degrees. That is it, five degrees. But that five degrees is happening in neutral in subtalar joint neutral okay which is part of the assessment we teach this in the bts level one that you need to understand how to put your client in neutral and then assess their maximum ankle dorsiflexion in that position it is also 
my knee is extended, my hip is extended. So I need to make sure that I am assessing ankle mobility appropriately based off of the rest of the joints up the chain, right? I can't necessarily transfer a squat and how much range of motion a client has in their ankle in a squat to how much ankle dorsiflexion they're gonna have when they walk because you're not comparing similar joint positions, right? The knees flex, the hips flex when we squat, the hips extended, the knees extended when we walk, okay? So we need five degrees in neutral, okay? Now, if you don't have five degrees, you will compensate. You will compensate. And essentially, these are your compensations, okay? So those compensations that you will see in your clients is they're going to walk like a duck. Feet are turned out, right? If you see that, I'm going to show you here just because it's a little bit easier, right? So anyone who's walking like a duck, just assume that they have limited ankle mobility walking like a duck, okay? An abductory snap is essentially a dynamic abducted gait in a sense. So the leg is behind, and if you can see my my right leg, I'm gonna drop down, come back, take a step, drop, do, boom, right? So it's going to be a dynamic compensation. It's called an abductory snap. Another one, cigarette twist, is they're gonna spin their heel in, go back to neutral, take a step. So they walk kind of like that, okay? The final one, early heel lift. This is someone who walks and they have a very bouncy gait kind of like that, okay? All those compensations. So already, already I'm teaching you guys how to start doing a gait assessment, right? Part of that gait assessment, you're going to be looking at initial contact, that loading response, mid stance, are they in neutral? How much does the pelvis move when we are in or transferring into mid stance? And then late mid stance, look at that ankle, are there compensations, all right? So I'm already starting to give you some tips, tips and tricks to assess gait. Okay, and then finally, we are looking at propulsion, push off, right? For here, this is where we are releasing elastic energy. So elastic energy is released at propulsion or push off, okay? Energy or that elastic energy return is coming from your Achilles tendon, from your plantar fascia, and then from your entire myofascial system, okay? What foot position, what is the foot position during propulsion? Bam, it is a rigid lever. Look at that rigid lever, right? So we got first MPJ dorsiflexion. Technically, when your first MPJ dorsiflexes, your plantar fascia tightens and it inverts your subtalar joint. So I want to see ankle plantar flexion, inversion of the heel, and some beautiful first MPJ dorsiflexion. Okay. Now that rear foot position, really, really important. You got to see the inversion to stabilize the rear foot because you're getting all the way up into the hips to create some really good external glute activation. Okay. Now we have another limiting factor here. If you do not have enough dorsiflexion in your first MPJ, ultimately you will compensate during push off. Okay. You will ultimately compensate during push off. And those compensations, right, are based off of how many degrees we have. Now, your goal for your clients is going to be a minimum, minimum of 30 degrees. 30 degrees dorsiflexion in the big toe. Awesome. 65 to 75. Ladies, or actually ladies and gentlemen, if you want to wear high heels, right, then you need probably a good 90 to 100 degrees of dorsiflexion in your first MPJ, okay? If you do not have at least 30 degrees, that's your minimum, you will compensate. You will compensate. Those compensations are going to be here. You're going to turn your foot out. So this is another reason for turning your foot out, right? Here, I'll show you again. So if you cannot get through a joint, you're going to go around a joint. So they're going to turn their foot out. This happens to also be referred to as a low gear push off. High gear, low gear. High gear, low gear. So again, part of your assessment for everyone, start watching the way that someone pushes off. If they walk and they're pushing off the side of their toes like this, then you know that there's probably something going on with that first MPJ. 
Now, another compensation for insufficient first MPJ dorsiflexion is instead of taking these long, beautiful steps, they're going to shorten their steps. They're going to start to shorten their steps so much that they either start to shuffle, they might march, and they become ultimately a propulsive. Okay. So if any of your clients are starting to become a propulsive, I mean, you know they're not moving efficiently. You can't, you cannot move efficiently if you are not actually entering the propulsive phase and releasing elastic energy, right? Okay. So those are your compensations, high gear versus low gear. So when you're doing your gait assessments, because again, we only got so much time, you guys, right? But when you start to look at gait, you're filming. I'm just filming some people walking on the walking on a treadmill. I love to do gait assessments on treadmills, especially when learning how to do a gait assessment, right? You literally need this person in front of you and you're just staring at them and staring at them and staring at them and look and see like, okay, what's their initial contact? Are they on the lateral side of their foot? I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching. Okay, I see it. Other foot watching, I'm watching, I'm watching, right? Become very repetitive in what you're doing. Now, if someone is walking away from you, because maybe you're in normally my gait assessments, I'll do in my office down here, have them walk walk back, I'll film them, right? So you can absolutely go down onto the floor and film them and then look through the camera. You could do that. And then just break down each phase, initial contact, loading, loading response. You can't see initial contact, mid stance, late mid stance and propulsion capture at least those four, get your screenshot, look at the foot position and then start to go further up the chain. Okay. So that is your intro to Gait, phases of gait, really what's happening, really this is a bottom up, um, BTS level two does top down. I really didn't even go into what's happening to your pelvis and your T-spine that much, but obviously very, very important as well. So do study more, okay? All right, so here's your three requirements for efficient gait pattern. Again, we reviewed this, so write this down. If there was an exam, for sure, this would be on your exam. You gotta be able to stand on one leg. Two, you gotta be able to isometrically contract fast enough to absorb the energy. And three, you need to be able to get into a rigid lever to get forward propulsion or forward progression. All right, so that first requirement, first one, you gotta be able to stand on one leg and balance. You need a stable base. I'm sorry, you need a stable base, right? So the ability to stand on one leg was the most important development, one of the most important developments in the evolution of bipedalism. Here we go. Can you, can your client stand on one leg for 10 seconds? That is your minimum balance assessment, right? The baseline, can you stand on one leg for 10 seconds, okay? You'd be surprised how many young 20-somethings cannot stand on their leg for 10 seconds, one leg for 10 seconds. Now, let's say if they don't, you need to start asking yourself, not everybody cannot stand on one leg for 10 seconds for the exact same reason, right? Is it the perception of the ground? Do they have neuropathy? What shoes are they wearing? Are we doing this assessment in shoes? Or are we doing this assessment barefoot, right? What surface are we standing on? Do I have them on a wrestling mat? Do I have them on an Eric's pad? Are they on an Aboso mat? All right, so what is the surface? What is their foot strength? Do they have bunions? Do they have hammer toes, right? We need to have strong toe flexors in order to balance on one leg. So I just need you to start asking yourself and start to shape the why, right? Why did the client not do that, right? So here's some solutions for helping the client improve their 10 second balance or really their balance in general. This program is not about just can they pass the test, right? We, we really want to build good balance, okay? So improve perception of the ground. Take their shoes off. Go minimal, right? Release the feet before you do balance exercises. Do the narrow ball release before you do the balance exercises. It's shown to improve balance, right? Use the Naboso insoles or socks. Use a Naboso mat, right? Improving foot strength, do the forward lean. Do short foot, use whole body vibration or use neuromuscular stimulation. <clears throat> whole body vibration, I have a power plate 
is hidden from the table, but I have a power plate on the other side of the table. Revitive, if you go to revitive.com, it's a neuromuscular system. It's kind of like a tens unit for the feet. Creates a little rocker. I really like that. Short foot and forward lean are awesome as well. I have tons and tons of videos on those. Okay. So it all starts with a stable base. So finding your foot tripod, spreading those toes. Remember, you need toe flexor strength in order to have a stable base. Neutral arch. If you need to use the naboso wedges to hold your foot in a neutral position when you do the exercises, then definitely get the foot wedges. Okay. That may mean that if they need the foot wedges when they train barefoot with you, they might need a post or a orthotic in their shoe. And that's okay. Sometimes people do, right? And then toe tension or activation of the foot intrinsics, right? And that's really what we're going after. So what I want to do is just show you, a, some of you may have heard this before. So I'm going to review it. Some of you, this might be brand new. So I just want to make sure that I'm doing that introduction on setting your base, how we do our balance basics on the kinesis board. So there's just three, yes. Three perturbations that I recommend on the kinesis board. And then guess what? We're going to continue on. So what I would say is for everyone, if you have a kinesis board, grab your kinesis board. If not, take your shoes and socks off. Just stand with me a moment. This little practical part of it is going to take like five minutes. Okay. And then we got a few more slides of our content. All right. So it all starts with a stable base. So when I teach a patient how to find a stable base, I want them to go to their foot tripod first. So foot tripod, spread the toes as wide as you can, place them down onto the floor. And then if you can see my legs, you see I'm slightly externally rotating my leg, right? And then I rotate, I'm gonna hold it, right? Slight bend in the knee, slight external rotation to stabilize my foot. And then to activate my digits, I'm either going to push my toes straight down into the ground, or technically this is where you could do the forward lean. Forward lean, you're gonna stand nice and tall with your stable base. Arms are by your side. You're imagining you're stiff as a board. Stay stiff as a board. Rock your body slightly forward and come back into a vertical position. Lean the body forward. Come back into a vertical position. One more time. Slight lean of the body. Back into a vertical position. Every time you lean forward, your foot should activate. You should feel that your toes pushed down into the floor, okay? Now, with the kinesis board, because I want, the reason why I'm recommending the kinesis board for optimizing gait is that, again, your requirement, the first requirement is that you have to be able to stand on one leg. So we have to have balance. So using this, so we have these foot pads or these foam pads on the bottom. They moved, I put them into position one on either end. You could put them together. That would be a little bit more challenging. These are the basic micro wobbles. You can get more advanced curved or thicker foam pieces to put on this to make it harder. But for right now, I'm going to show you just how to do a couple of our perturbations. So with your client, with yourself, with your patient, this is also a single leg platform. So we are doing one foot at a time. Every time I go on here, I'm going to spread my toes, set my base. I'm on my foot tripod, slight bend in the knee, and I'm going to bring it up for 10 seconds. I'm holding here for 10 seconds, and then I'm going to step down and repeat the other side. Okay, obviously coming up, blah, 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 10 seconds, okay? Now, if your client needs to be posted, right? This is our toe wedge, but I'm still going to show you just for the sake of this. I'm going to put it on the inside of the heel. This is if they're everting and pronating. I'm putting the wedge on the inside. So when they come up, they're going to be in a more neutral position. That neutral position in the client that actually needs this is going to put my glutes in a more stable position so that I can activate them better. Your glutes are extremely important important for balance and stabilization. 
Okay. If you want to use the toe wedge in the way that it was actually designed, I'm putting it on the front and going to my toes and still set my base, come here, and then I'm going to hold here. And as I do my balancing, I'm pushing my toe in the wedge. This actually improves my balance when I do this. Okay. I know that my foot is working harder than when I don't have the wedge. Awesome. Okay, so doing a few repetitions like that. Beautiful. Now the other balance. So here it says five minute balance series. So for that, round one, 10 seconds, both feet. Use the wedge if you want. Use the toe wedge, use the heel wedge. Your choice. It's your clients, your programming. Second, you're going to set your base. And this time, you are going to do a eye movement. The eye movement, you're going to have your client, they're going to be balancing on one leg. They're going to look to the right, look to the left, look to the right, look to the left. Now, you want to regress that. Have them go right, center, left, center, right, center, left, center. So go one, center, back. So you're kind of breaking it down. You can go right all the way to left, right all the way to left, or you could do a true saccade, which is essentially boom, 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 right? Your choice on how you want to do that is based off of your client's balance. Round two, which will be on the other foot. This time you are looking up, looking down, look up, look down, or you're looking up, look center, look down, look center, look up, look center, look down, look center. It's a eye or a visual perturbation, okay? Your next round is going to be a vestibular perturbation. Eyes are looking straight ahead and they're very, do you see how slight I'm moving my head, right? Moving my head like this. I'm not going like this, right? Just a general, no, 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 right? Other foot, yes, 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 right? Just a very subtle, okay? Slight little rock. Think of it more as just a rock, okay? No. Yeah, no, yes, good, okay? Your final perturbation is going to be something dual tasking base, okay? You could count 100 backwards in multiples of three, of seven, of eight, pick a number, make it challenging, right? You could have them spell a word backwards. You could tell them, oh, as you balance on one leg, tell me how you drive to the grocery store. And they have to say, oh, I back out, I take a right on Colt Street, and then I take a left on Fry. Just make them telling you how I get to the grocery store, <laughs> right? So it's, it, you can ask them questions around that, okay? There are some other ones that you can do, um, other dual tasking. You could do some, obviously there's eye hand stuff, catch a ball, right? Now we're kind of going into some other creativity, but really from the initial intent of the design of the kinesis board was just as much as I believe in doing a five point neural ball release every single day, I believe that every human being should train their balance at least five minutes every day. So can we please do this where you're even just like, I mean, everything is based on brushing your teeth, you guys. Can you brush your teeth standing on one leg, right? Um, if you use a standing desk, can you do like some of your Zoom meetings? Oh, you know what? As you guys are listening to this webinar, can you stand on one leg, right? And just do like a little couple minutes of balancing, right? That's great, right? How we want to sneak it in. That's your first requirement. That is by far one of the most important requirements. Requirement number two, you got to be able to absorb energy and transfer it. For this, you have to very rapidly be able to isometrically contract your feet and create tension. Okay, this foot to core strength, which is built around really that forward lean that I showed you or short foot. Now, forward lean and short foot is going to activate the integration of your feet to your core, which is via the deep front line that we see here. Really, the action of short foot is pushing your toes down into the ground. Now, for the sake of time, I do apologize, but I'm going to have you guys go to the YouTube and search for short foot. Actually, if you're getting the email, I'm going to be emailing you the video on how to do short foot. But I have a whole YouTube, I actually have many YouTube videos on how to do short foot. Okay. And it's really activating that deep front line. Now, another key requirement to 
uh, sufficiently absorbing and transferring energy is based around step length. So there's two steps in a stride, step length. Now, a lot of people in modern society take little staccato steps. Um, maybe you're carrying a purse or a bag. You have something heavy. Modern footwear changes this as well, right? Heel toe drop, um, different things like that. Increased sitting can tighten your hips. So then you don't have enough flexibility to take long steps. Um, I lived in New York for 20 years, and this is during the days of group exercise. And I used to carry all my CDs with me. <laughs> I'm sure there's some on who remember that and my microphone. Oh my God. So like all my CDs and my microphone, and I was literally in my gym clothes and all that. And I was literally weighed down on one side with all my gym stuff. So I would walk swinging only one arm. My left arm would not swing. So I completely created an asymmetry in my step length, right? One step is going to be very different than the other step because of the lack of moving the arms, right? So some requirements for proper step length that I want you to focus and achieve with your clients is going to be sufficient ankle mobility, at least five degrees in neutral. Reciprocal arm swing. And we got to swing more arms, right? We don't swing at our elbows. We swing at the shoulder joints. And then you want to make sure that you have sufficient T-spine and pelvis mobility. So we need to be able to decouple the T-spine and the pelvis. We already went through this as far as our compensation. So make sure you remember those compensations in the late mid stance. That's really where you would absorb it would be in late mid stance because as I'm taking that step, right? Part of where I'm going to see that compensation is in late mid stance, okay? Part of how we want to optimize and free the ankle is by doing our daily neural ball release. So definitely grab your neural balls, do that five point neural ball release, Okay. And then for your T-spine and your pelvis, again, I'm going to send you guys a video on how to unlock your pelvis and your T-spine. Boom. This is going to be what I'm going to send you guys. Okay. Sensory stick swings. These are actually really great. So you can also use things like walking poles. Smovi is essentially a ball bearing. It's weighted and you would swing it and there's ball bearings that are kind of vibrating through it and it has weight or using the sensory sticks as like a walking weight. I really like using those as well. So you get them to relax and feel the momentous aspect of gait. Gait is designed to be kind of like momentum. Okay. Remember, it's, it's fascial, it's momentous. Your third requirement, we are on our home stretch here, everyone. I know that we are going a little bit longer than usual, almost done here. Your third requirement is forward progression. So that final important aspect of walking is that you need to get somewhere. We have to have forward progression. Okay. So that is very important to be able to achieve a rigid lever. You need at least 30 degrees dorsiflexion. You are extending through all of your MPJs. So do you see this beautiful uh, lever in this picture, right? Part of your gait assessment is looking at the lever, right? Are they avoiding the first MPJ? Are they kind of compensating? Do they not move through some of their MPJs? Your toes have to stay on the ground. If you got hammer toes, you're, you're going to take away some of the power of the rigid lever. So use toe spacers, use the Naboso splay to keep those toes long, straight, and in contact with the ground. Single heel raise, okay? So part of what I, got, I need you guys to train is the capacity of your client to stand on one leg and boom, right? Can they do this? Many people cannot do that. You have to be able to have a single heel raise strength to optimize really gait, right? Efficient gait. Okay. You got to be able to get through your first MPJ. Part of that is your first ray. Again, sorry, you guys, I'm going a little bit quicker. Your first ray has to be able to plantar flex. Super, super important. And then the king of all foot exercises is a heel raise with a ball between your heels. So if you're going to do, do a heel raise, obviously do a single heel raise. That's important. If you're going to do a bilateral heel raise, put a ball between your heels, squeeze the ball together as you are doing your heel raise. That's going to activate your posture tibialis and get a lot more out of that exercise. Okay. Part of what creates a stable lever is the supination of your foot, which is your posture tibialis. Okay. 
All right, you guys, look how ridiculous this offer is. Oh my God. So ridiculous. 50% off. Oh my God. 50% off of the board. But my friends, you got to get this before August 31st. Okay. So August 31st, you can use the code KB50. This will work in every single Naboso.com, whether you are in Europe, UK, Canada, Australia, or the good old United States. KB50 will get you 50% off the Kinesis board, the Kinesis board. It does not mean 50% off your entire order. It is 50% off of the Kinesis board. Yes, if you are listening to this recording and it is September 15th, I am sorry, my friends, it does not work. This code is valid only through 831. And since I got your attention and it's before Labor Day, we have an awesome Labor Day sale that is happening this weekend. It's not gonna be 50% off the Kinesis board, okay? It'll be 20% off, but definitely get that Kinesis board. If you are recommending this to your clients, this is actually the time to tell them to go get it. If you are using it with your clients, then definitely take advantage of that. All right. All right, you guys type in any questions that you may have. I know it is right at the hour, but I'm going to take like five minutes. If you cannot stick around, I completely understand this is recorded. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you do have to go, otherwise I am going to jump in and do five minutes of questions for everyone. All right. Okay, Becky, I'm going to do yours in just a moment. Uh, Ronald says, what type or brand of shoes do you recommend for walking, running in the most biomechanical efficient way? Great question. It has to do with their foot type, right? Of course, I'm going to want to think of minimal barefoot shoes. But if I have a client or a patient who has helix rigidus, I actually can't use a minimal shoe. I need to use a rocker base shoe. So I may recommend something like a Hoka for someone with a helix rigidus because I'm trying to support step length in that client. In someone who has optimal ankle joint dorsiflexion, first and PJ dorsiflexion, foot strength, I'm going to go more minimal. Um, actually, a brand that I love, love is called Paluva. And I'm going to type this in for you guys. Paluva is a five-toed shoe, paluva.com. I love them. I absolutely loved Vibram Five Fingers, and then kind of they fell out of trend. So then I started wearing Vivos and other brands. And then I just got a pair of the Paluva, and oh my God, my toes are so happy. When I lift at the gym and I do like pull-ups and all my, oh my God, my feet are so happy. If you use code Emily Splickle, I just sent that to you. I think you get 15% off. I don't know. You get a discount. Type in the name. All right. Paluvas are awesome. They are a five-toed shoe, kind of like Vivo, Vibram, sorry, like Vibram, but there's actually a little bit of cushion in them, which I really like. Beautiful. So good, good question. Seth says, um, as the head nods, on the head nods, yes and no, does the gaze stay fixed or do the eyes move? Great question. So Seth, you actually want the eyes fixed. So I want the eyes fixed and as just as much as we can, a vestibular stimulus. That's also why I'm doing it more as like a, a nod versus like a whole dramatic moving of the head. We just want a little fasciculation of the vestibular system. Okay. Thank you for asking so that I could clarify. Carmen says, do neural balls need to be replaced after a while? I've used mine a lot and it doesn't feel as stimulating anymore. Maybe you're just getting used to it. So that's actually a great point. So the product is actually made of a food grade silicone that is designed to last. So most likely what is happening to Carmen, and if some of you have felt that with maybe some of our Noboso mats or some of the insoles, is that you're actually getting used to it. But don't worry, don't worry, because what you want to do is you just take a little holiday maybe use the socks instead of the neural ball just for a little bit and then go back to it. Okay. So you, you want to create 
textured variability or you play with how you bring texture to your nervous system. Because if you keep doing the same thing, same thing, same thing, the nervous system is going to tune it out. Um, but that is a really good question. And Carmen, oh my God, I don't want to forget about your shoes. Carmen has actually designed a shoe called Reshod. Check this out, you guys. Reshod. Reshod. Dot com and it uh, Carmen is a speed walker and it's a speed rocker shoe that I also recommend to my Helix Limitus, Rigidus, Neroma, first MPJ, second MPJ patients, um, in addition to Hoka. So I will say there's Hoka, which has a rocker, right? Obviously, there's Nike, Vaporfly, and other kind of rocker based shoes. Um, they're very expensive. If you have a client who's looking for more that minimal-esque environment, Reshod is actually a really great option. And it has that rocker that's designed for speed walking. So I've actually had quite a few patients that really liked the Reshod shoe. And Carmen is the designer here. Uh, Mark, I teach at a university. May I please share the video recording going forward every semester? This is exactly what I teach. Super important. Absolutely, Mark. Uh, reach out to me, Mark, if you're still on here. Um, Dr. Emily at ebfaglobal.com. Okay. But I love that. Absolutely. Um, are splay able to be used all day? Absolutely. Especially if you have bunions and hammer toes, you definitely want to. How long does it take to see a change in strength in someone's feet? I mean, it depends on where we're starting, right? Like depending on where we start, I definitely tell patients that I will put them on a six to eight week protocol. Um, sometimes I'll progress them every four weeks, but really uh, no shorter than four weeks will I progress them. And then I want to give them a good two months of consistently dedicating to foot awareness, foot recovery, foot strength, foot stimulation before we step back and assess, is this working? Okay. Um, are there any considerations you can outline for people with a Morton's foot? where she says a short first ray. And actually, Lori, it's not a short first ray. A Morton's foot is a long second metatarsal. It's not a short first ray. There is what's referred to as a short, a structurally short first metatarsal, right? So you have a short first metatarsal, but a Morton's foot is a long second metatarsal, okay? Um, and really... The considerations for that are kind of minimal. They'll get extra dumping to the second. Um, they're a little bit at risk of second metatarsal stress fractures, maybe hammer toes and plantar plate injuries on the second. Um, I think I have a whole lecture on the second MPJ. If not, I need to do one. <laughs> All right. Um, please repeat the kinesis board discount code. Oh my gosh. Sorry. KB50. KB50. That will get you your... 50% off. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, do you do assessments on general population? Absolutely, Louise. Yes. If you go to my website, dremlysplickle.com, I'm typing that in. Head there and you can schedule an appointment. Uh, you want to contact me, everyone. My email is Dr. Emily at, I'll give you the Naboso, at naboso.com. Or it's Dr. Emily at ebfaglobal.com. Um, ba -bum 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 -bum. Can you wear splay on only one foot? Absolutely. Yes, you can. Would love a second MPJ course. Okay. Guess what's coming up, you guys, next month. Um, can I use instead a kinesis board? I'm sorry, Aaron. I don't know the question. Um, please recommend the best method to exfoliate rough soles. <laughs> uh, so Catherine, I would say, oh my gosh, you guys, I have like all these great companies that I work with. Vosh, oh my God, go to Vosh.com. I hope you guys are seeing what I type in. Maybe not. Um, so what I'm going to do as we wrap up, I'm just putting in my podiatry website in the chat. I'm going to put in my email in the chat. And then for the last question about exfoliating the feet, there is a company called Vosh, Vosh.com. They have the, they're called Petty in a Box. Petty in a Box. Oh my God, they smell amazing. They're like $5 or something, $9. It's ridiculous. Um, you go to Vosh.com and I absolutely love doing those. 
So there you go. There's some information, the code you have up here. This is through August 31st. Um, beautiful. Aaron says, I don't have a kinesis board. What other equipment can I use? Well, Aaron, oh my gosh, Aaron, you have to get a kinesis board. They're 50% off. <laughs> so there is nothing like the kinesis board out there, you guys. The single leg platform, the Navoso texture, the micro wobble. I mean, I don't want to tell you to use an Eric's pad because that's totally taking away sensory stimulation. A BOSU is taking away sensory stimulation. If you don't have the kinesis board, I would say at least just be on a hardwood floor doing this or on a Naboso mat, right? Until you can get a kinesis board is what I would say. Okay. Oh, Alexis, we are going to end with this. Need a discount on splays. Catherine, your discount is coming over Labor Day weekend. So come Friday, you will get a discount on the splays. Alexis's question about toe socks, that Naboso needs to have toe socks. Guess what? Those are launching this Christmas. So we have it. We just had to figure out the manufacturing process. It is not as easy as one may think, but we have mastered that toe sock design. So it is launching this holiday. Thank you, Alexis. And do stay tuned. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your time. Definitely check out the Kinesis board, share with your clients. It is through end of day Thursday. The code will no longer work. And again, I do apologize if you are listening to this and it is possibly even December. I am sorry, but that code is only valid through the 28th through the 31st of September in 2023. Labor Day kicks off on Friday and you have another awesome sale. Thank you guys so much and stay tuned because next month there will be another free educational webinar by EBFA. Thank you guys.